Good morning. Thanks for joining us this morning here at Northern Lakes Community Church. We're going to begin our service with a word from Scripture, and then we'll sing a song of praise. Our Scripture this morning comes from Psalm 62. It says, For God alone my soul waits in silence. From him comes my salvation. He only is my rock and my salvation, my fortress, and I shall not be greatly moved. For God alone my soul waits in silence, my only hope is from him. He only is my rock and my salvation, my fortress, and I shall not be shaken. On God rests my deliverance and my honor, my mighty rock, my refuge is God. Trust in him at all times, O people, and pour out your heart before him, for God is a refuge for us. Great words this morning. Would you pray with me? Father God, we just thank you that you are a God that you can always, that we can always come before. We can bring our problems and our concerns and our questions to you because you are big enough to handle them. We thank you that you are a God who loves us and a God who listens to us. We come before you this morning in praise and in thanks and in worship. We pray in your name. Amen. Amen. Join us for our first song, Eye of the Storm. In the eye of the storm. On behalf of Northern Lakes Community Church, I'd like to welcome you once again for joining together to worship with us this morning. Today's message is inspired by one of the Wednesday night Bible study called What Do Jesus' Parables Have to Do With Me? a few weeks ago. The topic was about the, the, the parable of a landowner Jesus talked about. It's coming from the Gospel of Matthew chapter 20 verses 1 through 16. Let's listen to this parable, and, and then that we'll go from there. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for the usual daily wage, he sent them into his vineyard. When he went out about nine o'clock, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace, and he said to them, You also go into the vineyard. 
and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. When he went out again about noon and about three o'clock, he did the same. And about five o'clock, he went out and found others standing around, and he said to them, Why are you standing here idle all day? They said to him, Because no one has hired us. He said to them, You also go into the vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his manager, Call the laborers and give them their pay, beginning with the last and then going to the first. When those hired about five o'clock came, each of them received the usual daily wage. Now, when the first came, they thought that they would receive more, but each of them also received the usual daily wage. And when they received it, they grumbled against the landowner, saying, These last worked only one hour, and you have made it equal to us who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. But replied to one of them, Friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for the usual daily wage? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to this last the same as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or are you envious because I am generous? So the last will be first, and the first will be last. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So the topic on, on the Wednesday night a few weeks ago was fairness or unfairness being unfair or being fair. One participant immediately shared a life-learned lesson by stating, life is not fair. I think most of us know what it means. I also heard about somebody's family lore handed down from generations. As it says, the only fair in the world is the state fair. Well, this kind of expressions of unfairness are uh, not quite what this parable you just heard from the Gospel of Matthew might be teaching us, but they are close. The story of workers in the vineyard is probably one of the most discomforting parables Jesus ever told. It begins in the vineyard of Palestine where the grapes ripen in September, like here in northern Michigan. The ripening comes quickly. Harvesting has to happen before the fall rains. A few weeks ago, I saw a news media vineyard owner here in northern Michigan talking about a timely need for the harvest just before the first frost. So it was like a race against time. That was probably why vineyard owners in this part of the world needed a lot of day laborers for their short period of harvesting. And it makes sense to a lot of us. Anyway, the landowner in the story, in the, the Bible today, makes an early morning hiring trip into town. Another trip at 9, another at noon, then at 3 o'clock, and a final last minute 5 o'clock recruiting trip to the village square. So far, everything is according to custom. It's quite customary until the end of the day when the ancient model of Ernest Gallo, that generous American businessman and philanthropist for more than a few decades since 1950s, decides that he wants to pay everybody a full day's wages, whether they'd been sweating in the, in the hot sun for 12 hours or just working for the last hour in the cool of the late afternoon. No reason is offered in the scripture. Maybe the harvest was unexpectedly bountiful. Maybe it was just one of those sweet days in early fall. Lunch had been long and, and he was in love with the world. Maybe generosity was his nature. Whatever that was, custom did not include extravagant generosity like this. And all, you know, what broke loose. Imagine the scene. The five o'clock crew, having never broken a sweat 
is walking away, looking at their surprisingly fed paychecks, glancing at each other and saying under their breath, Whoa, not bad. Now imagine the crew that had been there since 6 a.m., tired, sweaty, indignant, grape-stained hands on their hips, wanting an explanation and wanting it now. It's not fair. Remember, they had been paid everything they had agreed on. The question this generous, honest gallo asked the un unhappy all-day workers is one of the great lines in all scripture. Are you envious because I am generous? It's like somebody saying, the only fair in the world is the state fair. New Testament scholar Tom Long sums up the parable like this. Everybody in the parable is tendered with the wealth of the kingdom. The deep river of providence fl fl flows through everybody's life. The huge of grace descends on all. Torrents of joy and blessing fall everywhere. And there, these first-hour workers stand, drenched in God's mercy, clutching their little contracts and whining that they deserve more. This is a multi-level, strategically disconcerting parable. It was meant to discomfort. It did so back then and it still does so now. The landowner stands for God, of course, so we are the workers. The vineyard is Israel, the world, or maybe the kingdom or the church. The story suggests that God loves and blesses all in a way that is beyond fair. We don't deserve any of it. Not the stuff, not the love, and not even life itself. We don't exactly deserve anything. Do we really understand all is gift and all is grace? So it is true, in a fundamental way, life is not fair. But the truth is that it is more than fair. In other words, God is not fair, but the God is more than fair. So, one edge of this parable is about God. The extravagant generosity of a God who loves and showers blessing whether we deserve it or not. Another edge of this parable is about us, human beings. How we respond to this blessing. And how we respond to unmerited love and grace, acceptance and bounty. The specific human response we hear about in this parable is, of course, complaint. The whining of those all-day workers who got everything they expected, but clamor like aggrieved adolescents that it's not fair. The assumption behind so many complaints about fairness is actually envy. It is not exactly fairness the all-day workers want. The truth is that they are simply envious, envious of the late-in-the-day guys who got such a sweet deal. Teddy Roosevelt once said, Comparison is a thief of joy. Comparison is a thief of joy. It truly rings a bell to me. There is an old Jewish folktale that sheds a new light on this angle of envy in Jesus' story about the workers in the vineyard. The story goes like this. There was a farmer in Poland whose family had been poor for generations. One night, the poor farmer was awakened by an angel who told him that he had found favor in the eyes of God, and God wished to bless him. Make three wish wishes and three requests, the angel said and God will be pleased to answer. There was one condition. There's always a catch in stories like this. The farmer's next door neighbor would get a double portion of everything he wished for himself. The farmer woke up his wife to tell her the news. As a practical woman, she suggested they give it a try. So they prayed. Blessed God, if we could just have a herd of a thousand cattle, 
we could break out of this poverty. Amen. So, no sooner had they prayed that these words that they heard the sound of cattle mooing outside the window. The hut was surrounded by a thousand magnificent animals. Over the next days, the farmer's uh, feet hardly touched the ground, so overjoyed he was with his blessing. He divided his, his time between praising God and making practical provision for this newfound affluence. On the third day of his prosperity, he was standing on a hill where he had decided to build a new barn. He looked across the valley at his neighbor's land, saw on that far hillside a herd of 2,000 cattle. For the first time in three days, the joy in his heart shriveled. He went home in a cranky mood and barely slept at night. All he could think of was his neighbor's entirely undeserved blessing and twice the size of his. Deep in the night, he remembered that the angel had promised the three wishes. With that, the old joy came back, and he, he dug deep in, into himself, inquired what would bring him more joy than anything else. He prayed, this time without consulting with his, his, his wife. Dear God, if it please you, give me a child that I may have descendants to carry on my name. Amen. He was hardly surprised when his wife announced a few months later that she was expecting. The days that followed were filled with boundless happiness. The farmer was busy enjoying his affluence and looking forward to fatherhood. He was so happy that night his child was born. The next Sabbath, he went to synagogue and gave thanks to God for the blessing of his newborn child. Then he had hardly sat down. However, when his next-door neighbor rose to pray, God has indeed been good for this very night. I became the father of twin sons. Our first farmer's mood darkened again. The joy he found in his blessings was somehow compromised by his neighbor's double portion. Well, that night, his mood waxed even darker. Then he remembered that, that he had yet one more request. The story says that he then offered his third prayer. God, please make me blind in one eye. Wow. No sooner had he spat the bitter words from his mouth that the angel appeared and asked him, Why, child, have you turned blessing into resentment? The request God will not grant because God is full of mercy. Know only this, not only have you brought sorrow to yourself, but you have brought sorrow to the very heart of God. So, what are you seeing right now? You look around and see another family that seems more ideal than yours. At school, there is always some kid who scores higher on an SAT than your own very bright child. You look to a neighbor who has a nicer boat and a much more beautiful lake house. It goes on and on. This comparing, this spirit-eating virus of envy. A newer car than mine, a bigger lake house than ours, a loftier promotion than mine, a fatter check, when we do this to ourselves, the joy we ought to be taking in life and blessing is dulled and replaced by envy. As Teddy Roosevelt put it, our joy robbed by the comparing, it just doesn't seem fair. Well, it is not fair. In fact, it is more than fair. Life isn't fair. And God isn't exactly fair. In fact, God is more than fair. The only fair in the world is the state fair. In the physical terms of this parable, most of you who are watching this are probably among the most blessed 1%. 
of the 7.8 billion people on this planet. Even the most modestly housed and moderately paid among us would be royalty most places in the world. The parable tells the truth about us. The truth that we are so often tempted to look right past the reality of our blessing as somebody who seems to have gotten even much more sweeter deal. The parable tells us the truth, the truth about us. In all of us, there is a shadow of those vineyard workers who got hired early in the morning, slaved all day, got paid, put their grape-stained hands on their hips, and lamented that the gratuitous good fortune of others. Remember this, if no more. You and I have been so blessed, so blessed with a life we did nothing to earn, so blessed with the bounty of good earth we did not create, so blessed by the unmerited love of God, we can do nothing to deserve. It is not fair. That means it is better than fair. Just enjoy it. Just enjoy it as God intended. For goodness sake, don't let the blessing of the 5 o'clock crew ruin you your day. In the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. As we get ready to close our last part of the service, join us with the hymn, I Need the Every Hour.
Thank you for joining us. Have a blessed week. Amen. Amen.